history, farmers have had to rely on genetic mutations or chance crossings between one plant and another in order to improve their crops. And even after scientists had learned in the early part of the 20th century how to use genetics and breed plant varieties, their methods were still crude. This kind of breeding involved mixing together thousands of genes from one plant with thousands of genes from another without being able to predict accurately what the result might be. The process of plant breeding is, is the science of genetics, and it is the science of genetic engineering to create new plants with better genetic constitutions that have a higher yield, that produce more. And so people have been selecting for uh, better plants all this time, but they've had limitations. They've only been able to work with plants that they can cross, and they've only been able, been able to work with entire genomes. So for example, if they bring a desirable trait in from one plant, they may bring in 10 undesirable traits at the same time. And it's a very hard and difficult thing to weed out and get rid of the undesirable traits and hold on to the good desirable trait, like greater yield or re resistance to a disease or something like that. However, by the 1970s, scientists were beginning to learn how to identify individual genes and to discover their function. One of these scientists was Luis Herrera Estrella. When I started working in plant molecular biology, it was a very exciting time because plant genes were started to be isolated and the, the whole field of plant biology was developing. Luis was one of a number of scientists worldwide searching to find some way of transferring individual genes from one plant to another. The answer came in 1981 when they hit upon a natural soil bacterium which did just that. Two years later, Luis and others successfully transferred a bacterial antibiotic resistance gene into a tobacco plant, and modern plant genetic engineering was born. So when we did these experiments and we successfully introduced uh, genetic material from other organisms into plant cells, uh, it was uh, a, a big moment of our lives because um, that opened the possibility of changing the way agriculture is done in the world. So it was very exciting because we realized the potential of this technology. Researchers immediately set to work to see if they could turn theory into practice and use the new genetic engineering techniques to develop better crops. One of the first big successes came three years later in 1986, when scientists succeeded in building disease resistance into a tomato plant. In 1987, scientists announced that they had engineered the first insect-resistant plant. And the following year, they created herbicide resistance for the first time in a crop. Only after more than 10 years of testing, after countless laboratory and field trials, were the first genetically modified seeds made available to farmers. But then the results were staggering. Farmer Max Smith found that using the new technology, he was able to grow healthy and high yielding crops, but using far fewer chemicals to do it. We've used from 20 to 40% to less herbicide and less insecticide since the, the GMO products have come out here. This has saved a, a lot of trips over the field and, and it's just a more chemically free crop now. How does this affect what you get in the grocery store in terms of health? Well, the best way I could describe that is what would you rather have? Would you rather have a corn that, uh, that had uh, bugs in it and had been sprayed with insecticide a couple of times, or would you rather have a BT engineered corn where there's never been any insecticide put on it, it's chemically free, and there's no insects in it, and it's a very safe food to eat? The advantages of using genetically enhanced seeds were so obvious to farmers that within just a few years, they were turning to the new technology in droves. Already, 60% of all soybeans grown in the United States comes from genetically modified seed. Worldwide, there is now over 100 million acres of GMO crops being grown. Recently, scientists have begun to think of entirely new ways to improve plants. Dr. David Abier is especially excited by the possible medical applications. What uh, genetic engineering of plants has to offer is the ability to enhance the plants we have now. For instance, we can increase the amount of vitamin E in a uh, ear of corn by 
eight or ten fold and make it so you don't have to take a vitamin pill with vitamin E in it. We may be able to get it just by eating our food supply. This is already being done with so-called golden rice, which has been engineered to contain higher levels of vitamin A. This is aimed at addressing a huge problem in the third world of so-called hidden hunger, where an inadequate diet leads to chronic vitamin and iron deficiency. What happens uh, uh, if you don't have white, enough vitamin A in your diet is that you simply go blind. Uh, you also have a problem that uh, within a year or two you would die because not only you go blind, but you also get predisposed to a lot of diseases like measles and malaria. Professor Prakash is one of a number of scientists working on improving the nutritional content of foods commonly consumed in developing countries. Biotechnology has already shown massive promise in addressing some of the problems of uh, hidden hunger. And so in sweet potato, our research at Tuskegee University has helped us to increase the protein content sixfold. Luis Herrera Estrella is now attempting to address another huge problem facing farmers in the third world, which is the presence of large amounts of poisonous aluminum in the soil. One of the most important constraints for agricultural production in tropical and subtropical areas of the world is aluminum toxicity. Uh, aluminum toxicity is present in acidic soils, which uh, comprise about 40% of the world's arable land. In, in soils which have aluminum toxicity, productivity can be reduced about 80%. And these areas is where poor farmers grow in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. To solve this problem, Luis has used genes taken from wild plants, which grow well in aluminum-rich soils. So we have identified these genes which are responsible for this characteristic of wild plants which are adapted to growing these soils, and we have transferred them to useful crops which have a much better potential to produce in acidic soils. Scientists from around the world are attempting to use genetic engineering to address all sorts of agricultural problems, from engineering fruits and vegetables to stay fresh longer, to making plants which are drought resistant. In short, they are showing how genetic engineering might be used to transform agriculture, both in the advanced industrial world and in the world's poorest regions. I have the dream and the vision that we will be able to make uh, every individual on this earth have enough food and of the right kind of food before the end of this century because of the continuing use of genetics. GM technology has the potential to make starvation and hunger a thing of the past. But the revolution which has been brought about by plant genetics has implications beyond the production of food. We're going to learn about the information that's in every gene of a plant. We're going to know about all the genetic variants that are responsible for uh, giving us the food that we have. And that is just the beginning. Just think about uh, all of the things that come from plants. We use plants for fiber. We use plants for feed. We use it for uh, plants for drugs. We're going to be able to improve all of these things. We're going to uh, live in a world where genetics can really be deployed to serve all kinds of purposes.